Welcome to another great week under the sovereign care of God and the Lordship of Jesus. Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. We're beginning a new chapter today in our study of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. And we'll be in this chapter for several weeks. I hope that you've been able to uh, print the outline for today. And that will be super helpful if you can do that ahead of time or just pause this recording now and go ahead and print that from uh, the WCC website if you have opportunity to do that. Please join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your divine care that you are our Father and that we can trust you during these uncertain times in our world. Uh, So thank you for sheltering us under the shadow of your wing Thank you for the glory of the cross of Christ in in which we can come uh, to find uh, grace and mercy in our time of need. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to encourage us, to quicken us in your word, and to prompt us to be the hands and feet of Jesus uh, in our world today. So God, thank you for your precious word that we have before us. Please teach us, instruct us, and guide us into all truth, we ask In Christ's holy name, amen. The series that we're beginning today, in Ephesians chapter 3, I've given the title to Mystery. So, a single word, Mystery. And often when we hear the word Mystery, we might think of something that's solved. So, I put that word in the heading box of our current study, in parentheses, Because that's not actually what uh, the word mystery in the New Testament means for us. It's not something solved. It's something that's revealed. A mystery that was unknown in ages past, but now revealed. And we're going to talk about the content of that mystery and how it was revealed uh, in our next couple of studies. So, if you have your Bibles open, let's look at Ephesians chapter Three. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 now, but we won't be doing all of the study on those verses today. We'll be splitting that up over several weeks. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets." This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. So that's where we're going to stop for today with the reading. And again, we'll only be focusing today on chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. So we start with our key theme, the message of the mystery. We'll be looking at that again over several weeks. Letter A on the outline, Paul begins with a prayer. He begins with the phrase in the NIV, For this reason, found in most of our texts, This is a little phrase that connects uh, chapter 3 to the previous information that Jews and Gentiles are united in Christ, who is the cornerstone. For this reason, Paul is going to continue to talk about this work of unity that Christ has accomplished that we studied in the latter part of chapter 2. That little phrase, for this reason, actually is an opening sentence of a prayer It doesn't sound much like a prayer as we might typically start, Dear Jesus, or Dear God, or Dear Father. But this is actually the opening of a prayer that Paul wants to pray for the Ephesian believers. 
we see the same phrase for this reason in chapter 1, verse 15, and that led directly into a prayer that Paul prayed in chapter 1. So this opening phrase connects the material of chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, that the Jews and Gentiles have been reconciled in Christ. We see in chapter 3, verse 14, the conclusion of, uh, or, or again, the, the prayer phrase for this reason is found in 314, and it's also found in chapter 4, verse 1. So some people believe Paul stopped his prayer in verse 1 here and continued it in verse 14 with the same phrase. And some other folks believe that he continues the prayer in chapter 4, verse 1. We notice that the end of verse 1, there is a change of thought indicated by the double dash that you find at the end of verse 1 in the NIV, ESV, and the NAS. King James doesn't include that dash. It just was a helpful grammatical reminder that Paul shifted from his thought of prayer into something else. So, number two on the outline, the intercessor. Paul says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Here's a key word for us in verse 1, prisoner. Now, why is Paul a prisoner? He's not a prisoner at this point in his life because of his crimes against believers or Christians called the way. Before his conversion in Acts chapter 8, uh, we remember that we saw Saul, who approved of Stephen's stoning. And Saul began in chapter 8, verse 3 of Acts, to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. So right now, Paul is not a prisoner because he's been arrested for crimes against believers in Jesus Christ. He's a prisoner because of preaching unity and equality between Jews and Gentiles in Jesus Christ. We know this because in Acts chapter 21 and all the way through the end of the book of Acts, we see and read about Paul's arrest, his several trials, and his imprisonment following his third missionary journey. So Paul was in prison at least for a three-year time period in Rome, we learn in the book of Philippians, one of his prison epistles in particular, in chapter 1, verse 7, that Paul was in chains. In Philippians 1, 20, that he was frequently uncertain of whether he would live or die. And in Acts chapter 28, verse 20, we learn that later in the imprisonment, he was actually in a rental house that he had to rent at his own expense. And yet he was there under, we'd say, house arrest. For he was chained, and yet he could have visitors who came to see him. So, why is Paul a prisoner, though, of Christ Jesus? We find the phrase that Paul identifies himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus five times in his letters here in Ephesians, in 2 Timothy, and also in Philemon. You see, Paul identifies himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus because he believes in the sovereign plan of God for his life. And that God's plan for his life, as it was pre-announced to Paul, included suffering. So Paul calls himself a prisoner of Jesus because he believes himself to be captive to Christ. He believes in the lordship of Jesus, that Paul is under the submission to Christ. He's bound to serve Christ, we might say. In Acts chapter 9, verse 16, the account of uh, the conversion of Saul, who became Paul, uh, Jesus is speaking to Ananias, whom he sent to Paul to speak to him about the mission that God had chosen for Paul. And Christ says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. It was pre-announced that Paul, in coming to saving faith in Christ by God's gracious work, would suffer for Christ's name. So we know that the church is established and it grows through regular people who face terrible odds. And Paul was one of them. Now, in his case, it was pre-announced that he would face terrible things for the sake of Christ. Christ. 
but we're uh, reminded of the words that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 to 10. There, God says to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness, even in people who fall prey to injustice in the world. God's power works through our weak circumstances and even our weak selves. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, even being in prison, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, Paul says, then I am strong. So God wins even in my weaknesses. So Paul being in prison, it didn't hinder the work of God because even there, that's where uh, God gave uh, Holy Scripture to Paul so that he would record it and send it in letters to the churches. The cause of Paul's imprisonment, number three on your outline, verse one says, for the sake of you Gentiles. So the purpose and existence of Paul in ministry is gospel proclamation of Jesus to the Gentiles. We learn this again from the conversion account of Paul in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Christ again says to Ananias, This man, Paul, is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles. Later in the book of Acts, chapter 21, verse 28, the Jews accused Paul of speaking against their Jewish laws and customs as he was teaching Christ to the Jewish people and Jewish nation. Acts chapter 22, Paul is recounting his salvation story, his testimony to the Roman officials and the Jewish people who had just uh, gone against him. And he recounts that Christ sent Paul to the Gentiles. And in Acts 22, verse 22, the very next verse, the Jews wanted to kill Paul because of that statement in chapter 22, verse 21, that Christ sent Paul to the Gentiles. I mean, this drove the Jewish people crazy that Paul, a Jew, and a Pharisee would be sent to the Gentile people. So opposition driven by the mission to the Gentiles, the Jewish opposition, is what made Paul then uh, a, a prisoner, right? The cause of his imprisonment. So this little phrase, for the sake of you Gentiles in verse 1, is bookended in verse 13 of the same chapter. So we see verses 1 through 13, there's bookends, that Paul was in prison for the sake of the Gentiles. We see the same little phrase, for you, in verse 13, referring to the Gentiles. Let's move on to letter B in the outline. Let's look at the gift that was given. Now, number one, there's a condition that starts this sentence. It doesn't come out very well in English, but let's talk about verse 2 as we look at the condition. Paul starts by saying, surely you have heard. Let's look at that word surely. In the Greek text, it actually is the conditional word if. And that word begins a condition of fact, namely that if the first part of the condition is true, then the second half of the condition will be true. And that's what Paul's trying to express to his people. The first half of this condition is true, that they have heard of the administration of God's grace. Now, the conclusion of the condition is in verse 13, that if you have heard about the administration of God's grace, then, verse 13, don't be discouraged because of my suffering for you. So this conditional statement is split between these 12 verses, from verse 1 to verse 13. The King James and the NAS actually translate the conditional word if in their translations. The NIV translated it as a statement of fact, which is what the condition expresses. So the NIV put in the word surely, definitely. The ESV put in the word assuming, which actually questions whether the Gentiles heard it, and that really is not the best translation of the rendering of the Greek here at this point. 
So number two, who are the hearers of this statement of fact? Surely you have heard about. Now, Paul was ministering in Ephesus approximately 52 to 55 AD, a three-year time span. And he's imprisoned in Rome approximately 60 to 62 AD. And that's where he's writing the five prison epistles, including the letter to the Ephesians. He's speaking to the believers in the church at Ephesus. He says, surely you have heard about. So he's speaking about the first generation of believers who directly heard from Paul when he ministered to them just a few years earlier than his imprisonment. But the second generation of believers heard not directly from Paul, but they heard, of course, from the first generation of believers. And what is it that they heard? We look at the third thing under letter B on our outline. They heard about the gift. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me. So let's stop there. Here's the key point in verse 2. God's grace, Paul calls a gift that was given to him. God's grace. So what was given to Paul? Let's look on this little phrase, but we're going to work on it backwards, believe it or not. What was it that was given to him? We just back up a little bit and we say it was God's grace in Christ that was given to him. And that grace he is to administer... He's to do a specific job with that grace. So now we back up again and we look at the word in the NIV text, administration. The NIV translates administration, which is like an office manager. We kind of understand that, that term to refer to. The ESV and the NAS translations put in the word stewardship. That's actually a helpful word. I like that one too. The King James translates the word dispensation, which is not a word that is really commonly known or understood, but it means to give something out, to dispense something, or to distribute something. And if you understand then that, that word, it can make sense in the sentence too. Now the Greek word for administration in the NIV, or stewardship, or dispensation, is a word that translates the rule or the order of the house. The term refers to a steward or a manager. In Greek and Roman homes in the New Testament, stewards cared for their family. A household steward managed the family, the children, the, even the slaves, and he did that for the sake of the homeowner. So, in this context, God himself is the owner of the spiritual house, as we looked at it in chapter 2. Paul is the manager or the steward of the house by God's choice and by God's assignment. And in chapter 2, verse 19, previously, the believers are called members of God's house. So, we see this all in Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, where Paul wrote, I have become the church's servant by the commission, same word administration or stewardship, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. So looking at verse 2 again, God's grace was given to me, Paul says. It was given. Notice carefully, Paul didn't choose his occupation or his career. This grace was given to Paul. It was a divine plan for his life, even as there is a divine plan for your life. So Paul wrote in Acts 20, verse 24, to the Ephesian elders when he was going to leave them after spending three years with them. He says, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. See, again, Paul says, the task that has been given to me. Thus, Paul, listen carefully, is not an inventor 
of the Word of God. He doesn't invent it himself. He receives it from God and he delivers it to God's people. So Paul's salvation and the revelation of God's Word are gifts that are given to Paul. Paul received the gift of salvation and the Word of God and he gives out the gift, the message of salvation and the revelation of God to God's people. So this phrase, God's grace given to me, is also a bookend phrase found here in verse 2. But if you glance at your Bible text, it is also found in verse 7, which was the closing verse I read just moments ago. So the phrase, God's grace given to me, is a bookend that encloses this set of verses through verse 7. Let's look at number 4 on the outline under letter B. The beneficiaries. Paul says very simply, the beneficiaries are for you. So, Paul has received the gift of grace that was given to me for you. This is, of course, for the Ephesian uh, believers, the Gentile and the Jewish believers in Ephesus. Paul was commissioned to preach God's grace to the Gentiles. And in Galatians 1.16, we see this parallel uh, verse that God was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So this is the end of our first segment of our recording. And uh, you're welcome to go then to the discussion questions that are on the uh, second page of your outline. And each discussion question today at the end of the question uh, has the specific verse that the question is listed from. So I encourage you, uh, to look at those discussion questions, to think through the first half of our study that we've done right now, and then when you're ready, come back again and start the next segment. Welcome back to our current study of Ephesians chapter 3. Our series is, is entitled Mystery Revealed. And in our current study, we're studying Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. We began in the last segment on Roman number 1, the message of the mystery. We're looking at this message that was specifically packaged and given uh, to Paul as a mystery which is now revealed. And in the last segment, we looked at letter A, the prayer that was begun in verse 1. And we looked at letter B, the gift that was given, the grace that was given to Paul in verse 2. Now we pick up with our study in letter C on your outline, the mystery known in verse 3. The mystery known. If you have your Bible in front of you, let's just look at verse 3. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. So, number one, under letter C, the mystery known, we see that there is the gift which is opened in verse 3. Paul writes, that is the mystery. Now, that's the key word that we want to pick up on here from verse 3, the mystery. This is something which is being made known to Paul for the very first time, which he didn't know previously to this. And it wasn't known at all in the Old Testament. That's a brief look at the key word in verse 3 and for this entire chapter, mystery. Mystery is the central concept of this chapter. It is a specific part of God's grace given to Paul. The Greek word here that Paul gave us, mystery, its, its root word means to shut your eye so that something, of course, is not seen. Now, the English word mystery, when we use that word uh, in our culture, usually means something that is dark or obscure a mystery in English, when we use that word, means something is secret or puzzling or maybe inexplicable. 
Now, in the first century, in the Greek and Roman world, when they used the word mystery many centuries ago, it typically referred to pagan religions and to the secrets and the rituals of initiation in order to enter that organization. That's not what it means here in Paul's usage of the word. In the Greek New Testament, when the word mystery is used, it means a truth regarding Jesus Christ, which was previously hidden from human discovery in the Old Testament, but now is disclosed by revelation of God through the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. So let me say that again. A mystery in the Bible is not about secret rituals or initiation. That was the pagan cultural understanding of the word. When it's used in the Bible, it means a truth regarding Christ that was previously hidden from human discovery in the Old Testament, but now is disclosed by direct revelation of God through the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. You may think of the word mystery from the 1741 uh, writing of a Handel, who wrote in the Messiah, the aria, entitled, I Tell You a Mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Maybe you think of the word mystery from that context. Handel was drawing that uh, song from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, which talks about a mystery. The Old Testament roots of this word mystery, it's found only eight times in the Old Testament. So you'd say even the word mystery was a little bit of a mystery in the Old Testament. It's found again only eight times in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verses 18 to 19, verses 27 to 30, and verse 47, and finally in Daniel chapter 4, verse 9. All of these verses are listed for you in your outline. But the word mystery is nowhere else in the Old Testament. It was never used anywhere else except the book of Daniel. Now, just a brief reminder of the context then of Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar, the ruler of Babylon, who you know has taken all of the Jewish people into captivity has had a dream of a giant golden statue, which was a picture of himself. And Daniel 2 verse 18 reads, He, Daniel, urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. So you see, Nebuchadnezzar had told all his wise men, if you cannot tell me my dream and then interpret it correctly for me, I'm going to kill you all. <laughs> so Daniel and his, his uh, wise men, Jewish friends with him, uh, were also under that same execution order. And God revealed the dream to Daniel as well as the interpretation of it so that the mystery could be revealed. Now in the New Testament... The word mystery is found 27 times, quite a bit more, um, you know, than we find it in the Old Testament. The word is found three times in the Gospels, so not very many times, but it's used by Jesus. It's found 20 times in the Epistles, and it's used four times in the book of Revelation. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 11... Jesus speaks about the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven that have been given to his disciples, but not to the crowds or not to the people. In the NIV, in Matthew 13, 11, they translate the word mystery as secrets. So the parables were given by Jesus as a mystery so that their understanding would not be readily available to everyone, especially those without faith but it would be available or revealed to those who have trusted in Christ as the Son of God. In the epistles, in general, the term mystery means something again of Christ uh, as the Messiah, 
or Christ's role in God's redemptive plan, or the Gentiles in the saving plan of God. All of those themes are wrapped up into the term mystery that we find in the epistles. In the book of Ephesians itself, the term mystery is found six times in this epistle. In the Greek text, it's also found several times translated where relative pronouns occur in the Greek text, but the translators uh, put in the word mystery, which the relative pronoun modified. There are indeed four great mysteries in the book of Ephesians, and next week we're going to uh, take a pause on our textual study here just to look specifically at the mysteries in the New Testament. But a quick survey of the term mystery found in the book of Ephesians. Its first usage is in chapter 1, verse 9, where God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure to bring all things, in verse 10, in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. The second, third, and fourth usages of the word mystery in the book of Ephesians are found in the text that we began studying today, chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, and then in verse 9. In chapter 3, verse 6, in the NIV and the ESV text, those two translations translate a relative pronoun which with the word mystery, even though the word mystery literally does not appear in the text of the Greek. It's taken from chapter 3, verse 4. Now, the fifth usage of the word mystery in the book of Ephesians is in chapter 5, verse 32, where Paul says, this is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ in the church. So we're going to learn about the mystery of the bride and the groom or the marriage of Christ and his people, the church. The sixth usage of the word mystery in Ephesians is in chapter 6, verse 19. Paul says, Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. So we look at the second point under letter C, the delivery of the gift. Paul says in verse 3 that the mystery was made known to me by revelation. So he's indicating to us how the gift of the gospel and the mystery were delivered to him. It was made known to me, Paul says. Now that verb is important because we recognize that God wants to make himself known to men. And secondly, it's our privilege and our responsibility that we make God known to the rest of the world. That's the Great Commission. So when we look at this part of verse 3, that the mystery was made known to me, Paul says by Revelation, we're talking about the doctrine of divine inspiration of the text of the Bible or the doctrine of the revelation of, of God to ourselves in the Bible. Sometimes we use the phrases, the doctrine of the transmission of the text from God's mind to Paul's pen. Not a, not a transmission in a vehicle, of course, you understand, but how did God get his thoughts, his holy thoughts, to Paul's mind, and finally that Paul's hand wrote the word of God with his pen? In 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, we read that Paul wrote, All Scripture is God-breathed. This is very, very important verse. God breathed out his holy word to the writers who wrote it down. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 34, verse 10, we know that uh, Moses had a unique relationship with the Lord in that the Lord knew Moses Face to face, he communicated audibly, verbally, directly to Moses. But God communicated his word in many different ways during many different time periods. He didn't always speak audibly or directly to the writers of Scripture, 
Sometimes, as this verse indicates, he revealed his word to the writers. Again, in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 7, verses 11 to 12, this is a unique verse that shows how the Old Testament even understood the transmission of God's word from God to men who wrote it down. Zechariah 7. But they, the Israelites, refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs and stopped up their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his Spirit through the earlier prophets. So that last phrase of Zechariah 7.12 is so important. The Old Testament even knew that God would send his words by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would reveal those exact words to the prophets. But when God's people refused to listen to those words, of course, then uh, we're out of fellowship with the Lord. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we have the New Testament statement of how the gift of God's word was delivered. 2 Peter 2, 1, 20. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of men. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's a great verse, isn't it? They spoke as they were carried by the Holy Spirit. So how did Paul get his mission, and how did he get the, the message and the mystery that he was to convey? Verse 3 says he got it by revelation. So God reveals himself to Paul. So, the, the, there are many different ways that, again, God reveals himself. There is general revelation where God reveals himself in the beautiful creation as we see uh, things coming back to life again from our, our dead winter time period. As we see grass getting greener and spring flowers and coming to life. As we see leaves coming out of trees that look absolutely dead. We say God reveals himself generally in creation. But God specifically reveals himself through the Bible, through his holy word. Revelation means that God discloses himself and he gives divine truth to us who read the scripture. The, the word revelation that Paul uses here then is the Greek word apocalypse, which is the title or the name for the last book in the New Testament. To reveal, or an apocalypse, is to unveil something. It's to take a covering off. So God takes the covering off so that people can know him and see him and understand him. Now, sometimes God revealed himself, or he took the veil off through dreams, visions, through miracles, of course, God directly revealed himself through the sending of Jesus Christ, the incarnation of Jesus, where God in human flesh is walking on earth. Sometimes God revealed himself through direct appearances to people, such as Paul on the, the Damascus Road. And sometimes people would merely hear the voice of God. So there's many different ways that God revealed himself. But Paul says in verse 3, he received the mystery, the message of the gospel by revelation. This is God's divine process of moving his thoughts through Paul's mind to Paul's pen. Paul didn't make it up, friends. The words we have in the Bible are the very words of God. This is why we can have confidence in the Bible. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1 verse 12 to that congregation, I did not receive the gospel from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. 
In Romans 16, 25 and following, Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. Now, this revelation was not only given to Paul, but if you let your eye drop down to chapter 3, verse 5 in our Ephesians text, we see that the revelation was also given to the holy apostles and to prophets. There were other people who received the revelation of God and recorded it, which is how we have our New Testament books today. Now back to your outline, point number three under letter C, we look at the repetition. There's a phrase that Paul says here at the end of verse three, as I have already written briefly. So in verse three, he received the mystery made known to him by revelation, and he's indicating he's already written about this mystery a little bit. So all we would have to do is go back to chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, where we read that there's a mystery uncovered or unveiled, that the Jews and the Gentiles would be combined into one family of God because of the cross of Christ. Now, some people believe that Paul, in the phrase, as I have already written briefly, is actually pointing back to chapter 1. And in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10 is where Paul used the term mystery for the first time in this epistle. Either way, we wouldn't get to a wrong understanding. He's already written about mystery in this epistle. So, uh, let's look at letter D then, the closing section for our study for today. Letter D on the outline, the insight shared in verse 4. The insight shared. Verse 4, Paul says, In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So Paul is saying that when the believers in Ephesus read this letter that he's written, they themselves will receive insight into the mystery that Paul himself knows. So number one on the outline, the present writing. Paul says, in reading this. In other words, biblical truth and its power is transferable by reading it. God put the power of his word accessible to people who can read it and can hear it read or hear it preached and taught. Bear in mind, nobody in the first century had a personal copy of the scripture. There just weren't any available, of course, until all the scriptures had been written for the first time and gathered by the end of the first century. And it was only at the late part of the 15th century that the printing press had been invented and come into use so that the Bible began to be printed for the first time in the late 1400s. Also keep in mind that there was a great amount of illiteracy in the first century world. And illiteracy necessitated the public reading of scripture on the Lord's day. So in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus went into the synagogue, we read this. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. And you can go to Luke 4 and, and read about the, the prophecy that he read, of course, which concerns himself. Other places in the New Testament that, have, of course, encourage the reading of Scripture publicly. Colossians 4.16 After this letter has been read to you, See to it that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from the Laodiceans. 
1 Thessalonians 5.27, I charge you before the Lord to make this letter read to all the brothers. And 1 Timothy 4.13, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Now, what does Paul say will be the result of, of reading. So, point number two on your outline at verse four, the result of reading. Paul says, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. And the word understand is our key word in verse four. In other words, the Bible is written to be understood. It can be understood even by the youngest of people reading it to the oldest of people reading it. Even though we understand 2 Peter 3.16, as Peter says, some things in the Bible are hard to understand. So it, it requires, of course, ongoing reading and studying and meditating on the Word of God to understand certain portions of it. But overall, especially the gospel message is available to everybody at every age. And Paul says, by reading and hearing the scripture read, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Now, the text is interesting there, because Paul says in the Greek, you will be enabled to understand. Our English translates, you will be able. But it's a passive verb, you will be enabled which indicates, of course, that it's the Holy Spirit who teaches us when we read the Word of God and when we hear it read. He says you will be enabled to understand, which means you can gain insight, especially in spiritual truth. This is a function of the Holy Spirit, to give us understanding of the Holy Will and Word of God. Now, I find it interesting, of course, the disciples were often hinges between the Old Testament world and the New Testament world, and with the coming of Christ, the disciples were often the test cases of spiritual understanding. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus fed the 5,000, and in the next chapter, it records in Matthew 15 that he fed another 4,000, and of course, plus women and children. So in Matthew 16, this text is really interesting to me, verses 5 and following, listen to this, and we're going to see how the disciples, of course, are that hinge for spiritual understanding and how the Holy Spirit would work in them. Now, when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them in verse 6. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, It is because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Here's our key word that Paul used in in verse 4. Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You see, we know that Christ is the provider of earthly bread. That is true. But he himself is also the provider of spiritual understanding, which we can only get from him and through the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was trying to give them a lesson. When you hear me talk about yeast, don't think of a loaf of bread. Think about the bad and false teaching that rises like yeast among those who don't know the Lord. And, and uh, Paul used that same picture of yeast being bad in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6-7. to 
I'll let you look that one up for yourself. So Paul says that you will be able to understand my insight. I'm going to look at that little phrase here for just a second. Uh, I, I found that quite interesting. So insight is gained through the Holy Spirit in us. The King James translated that same word, knowledge. You will be able to understand my knowledge. The Greek word uh, translated insider knowledge is synesis. Synesis, which is a quick perception. You will be able to have a quick perception or understanding. An ability to put two and two together. To perceive the interrelation of various factors or truths or event. So when Jesus was uh, the boy at age 12 in the temple, Luke chapter 2 verse 47, everyone who heard him in the temple was amazed at his synesis, at his understanding and his answers. In Colossians 1 verse 9, Paul wrote, We have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And in 2 Timothy 2 verse 7, Paul says, Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. So that's the same word Paul used here in Ephesians 3 verse 4. So the Lord gives understanding. We are to ask God to fill us with wisdom and understanding. And then, as verse 4 closes, uh, we will have insight into the mystery of Christ. So Christ himself is the content of the mystery. Now, that's the close of our study for right now, but here's a little extra um, chapter that we're going to do at the close of verse 4 here. I just thought for special focus, we'll take just a few moments to think about the doctrine of illumination, which is the enabling of the Holy Spirit for us as we read scripture, to understand scripture, to recall it, or to apply the truths of the Bible to ourselves and to our lives. So we're going to just quickly review five principles of illumination that are really important for us, which I felt this text uh, wanted us to uh, review for ourselves. So first of all, number one, this is on your outline, the scripture passages, of course, and these points. Number one, as we think about the work of the Holy Spirit to illumine the Bible for us, it's like turning a light bulb on, right? Turning a lamp on. The Holy Spirit is the one who turns the light on so that we can understand the Word of God. So here's point number one. Unredeemed human intellect cannot understand the Bible. So it's possible for unsaved people to understand certain truths and facts in the Bible, but it is not that the truths of God or the spiritual meaning is not accessible to people who are unsaved. Deuteronomy 29 verse 4, But to this day the Lord has not given you a mind that understands or eyes that see or ears that hear. John 1 verse 4, in him Christ was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. John chapter 3 verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. And will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. And 1 Corinthians 2.14 The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned or discerned by the Spirit. So, our first point, unredeemed human intellect cannot understand the Bible. Let's look at a second truth. Number two, 
a living relationship with Christ is required to understand the Bible. Well, that would make sense as we looked at the opening verses. John 1 verse 9, The true light, Jesus, that gives light to every man was coming into the world. John 8 verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Notice Jesus' invitation. Whoever walks with me, right? Whoever follows me. Acts chapter 8 verse 30. This one is interesting to me. This is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. In other words, he's, he's reading from the Old Testament Bible. He's reading from the Bible, and yet he doesn't understand it. This is the point of the passage. Philip asks, do you understand what you are reading? Verse 31, the eunuch replies, how can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. That verb explains is interesting. It's the uh, word for leading or guiding a blind man. Unless someone explains the scripture to me, it cannot be understood. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 has been a, a treasured passage for me for many years. There Paul says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. God makes light shine in our hearts. He makes the knowledge of Christ come alive for us. In Luke chapter 2, verse 32, the aged Simeon uh, says this regarding Christ, that he is a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. The morning star is a reference to Christ. It's the Greek word phosphorus, which is a, a, a um, aluminum or a metal, I don't know the correct term, uh, which, which glows, right? A, a, an element which glows, and Jesus is the light of the world. And when he rises in our hearts, when we receive him as our Savior and Lord, then that's the beginning of the process of illumination for us. So the second point, living relationship with Christ is required to understand the Bible. Let's go to our third point. The Holy Spirit is needed to understand the Bible. And of course, if you are saved, point number two, then you already have the Holy Spirit. So we look at a few brief verses about his work. John 14, verse 16 and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And John sixteen thirteen, Jesus says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to guide us into truth and to uh, help us to gain understanding of the great things of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 9-10. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. And also, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, just a few verses later, We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. 
So point number three, the Holy Spirit is needed to understand the Bible. Point number four, trained teachers are used by God to help us understand the Bible. So we see that God, of course, employs people with various gifts in order to help us to understand what God has written and revealed about himself. So in Luke chapter 24, when Jesus is walking with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So here Christ himself was the teacher who was explaining the scripture to them. Later in that same chapter, Luke 24, they asked each other, the two disciples, after Jesus had uh, broken the bread and disappeared, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So Christ, again, is the one who opened scripture as a trained teacher. He opened the scripture and its meaning to the disciples. Acts 18, verse 24, a Jew named Apollos began preaching Christ in Ephesus, yet only knew the baptism of John. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So here, a husband and wife missionary team with their sleeves rolled up were used by God as people who explained the word of God to someone else more adequately. Now, Acts 26, 17, uh, Christ is speaking uh, to uh, Paul, or Saul previously, at his conversion, and Paul is sharing his uh, testimony uh, with the Jewish people. Uh, I am sending you to them, Jesus said, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What's the point? Christ is sending Paul to the Gentiles to open their eyes. So even godly men and women who are used by God are used to help open the eyes. And the power is not in the man or in the woman but it's in the message that they deliver. So Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 speaks about gifts uh, of pastoring and shepherding and teaching, which are given, that God gives those gifts so that the word might be opened. And finally, in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, there Paul says, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable men, who will also be qualified to teach others. In other words, the word is to be continuously given out by moms and dads and grandparents and aunts and uncles. We are to take the word that we have received from trained people and we are to give it out to other people so that the word might continuously go out. So our fourth point, that trained teachers are used by God and by the Holy Spirit to help us to understand the Bible. And our last point for today, consistent personal reading and studying is needed for us to grow in the Bible. So already in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, Moses said this to the uh, children of Israel, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Psalm 1 verse 2, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. We are to be a people who meditate all day long on the things of God. Psalm 119, verse 18, the psalmist uh, has a humble prayer. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. 
In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Bereans examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul was saying was true. In 2 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul writes, When you received the word of God, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. So, one of the simplest ways for the work of the Holy Spirit in illumination to work, James says in James 4 verse 8, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. 2 Peter 1 verse 19, And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it. And finally, in 2 Peter 3 verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, brothers and sisters, we are finite individuals, and we possess an imperfect knowledge. But the Word of God is perfect, and it's all that we need for life and for godliness. So, our last point, our fifth point, that consistent personal reading and studying is needed for us to grow in the Bible, in our understanding and relationship with the living God. We're to talk about these things. We're to write them down. We're to memorize them. We're to meditate on the Word. We're to ask God to open our eyes so that our heart can receive what He has to give. We are to examine Scripture. We are to come near to God when we don't understand what a passage or a section of Scripture means. We are to pay attention to the Word. We are to accept the Word as it is the Word of God. And we are not to stay where we're at in our understanding. We are to grow. We are to grow in grace and in knowledge. And Holy Spirit, help us to do that. So this is the end of uh, this segment and of our study for this week. So please make sure to look at the discussion questions at the end of the outline. Engage with someone else in this part of our study, especially if you have questions about the Word of God or understanding it. And uh, next time we'll get together, next week we're going to do a special uh, study, a focus on the eight mysteries of the New Testament. So I hope you'll come back and join us for that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the time that we've had now to be bathed in your word. And thank you, Holy Spirit. We want to acknowledge your presence, even though most of the time we are not perceptive of your presence or of your working. But you work in a mightily powerful way to open the eyes of our heart that we might see Jesus and that we might behold the glory of God on his throne in this world, even in the midst of crisis and chaos. So, Holy Spirit, please keep opening our eyes. Please do not allow us to become callous in our study of Scripture, or, or to think of it as something we've already done, we've already read this, there's nothing new. Holy Spirit, help us always to have hearts which are hungering for more of God. Even in the passages we've grown up with since we were children, help us to learn and grow in each one of those familiar ones. And then, Holy Spirit, help us in the hard sections. Help us in the difficult chapters where we have some big questions about what God you're doing and, and what you're accomplishing and how we are to apply that to our lives. We need your help for continuous growth, and we trust that you will grant it. For Christ's honor and glory, we pray. Amen. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.